Well, friends, good day, and welcome to the online ministry of St. Augustine's Church in Inverell. Uh, my name's Matt, and it's great that you've chosen to tune in with us today, especially since this is Good Friday for 2022, as we celebrate our, our Lord Jesus and his death and what that means for us. Uh, let me read our sentence of scripture for today. It comes from John's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 31. Jesus said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the ruler of this world be cast out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. And with that great truth, friends, let's pray. Almighty Father, look graciously upon this your family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given up into the hands of wicked men, and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. Friends, now we go to a time of praise. Friends, now we come to the ministry of God's Word. And so if you've got a Bible, you might like to open it uh, for our Old Testament reading, uh, which is from uh, Isaiah 53. It's the whole chapter. Uh, our psalm for today is from Psalm 31, and it's just verses 1 to 5. And our New Testament passage uh, that we're going to be hearing from uh, in a moment is from Luke 23, 32 to 46. That's Luke 23. 32 to 46. Friends, take a moment to read the scriptures for yourself now. I'll read them out loud, read them with those you're watching with, and then we'll come to think about them together. Psalm 
I think the point of Jesus dying is um, uh, I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, man, I don't know, some sort of a self-sacrifice to, to reach uh, the next level of, of, of existence. As a demonstration. He had to go to those extreme lengths to get his, I mean, his messages heard. And it, just, it just doesn't make sense to me. You know, dying, him dying for our sins. I would say he died for his people. He was a threat to the authorities. They wanted rid of him. We needed martyrs back then like we need martyrs now. As, a, as an act that was large enough and dramatic enough to grab the attention of others. We can't, look, we can't speculate on it now because I mean it's how many years in the future and that's even if the guy existed way back when and, and if the stories are even true. Why did Jesus die? I mean people have all sorts of ideas. Did he die as a dramatic act trying to catch people's attention and, and make his message known as a big statement? Did he die as, as an example for us? I mean, maybe his death doesn't quite yet make sense to you. Why did Jesus die? What do you think? Why are there people from every country around the world who stop at Easter to celebrate Jesus' death? Why, in their closed countries around the world, countries where uh, Christianity is outlawed, are there thousands of people who risk their lives after hearing about Jesus' death to follow him? Why? Well, the story of Jesus' death, it may be a familiar one for you. You may not be that familiar with it. And in fact, uh, it may be something that doesn't quite make sense at all to you yet. Either way, come with me today and let's take a look at a primary document, an eyewitness account at the moment of Jesus' death. What we'll be looking at, it's in Luke's biography of Jesus' life. Uh, and let me pray as we come to think about this now together. Heavenly Father, as we look at your word now, please speak into our lives. Please make yourself known to us. Please help us to understand why Easter matters. Help us to understand why Jesus died. Amen. Well, friends, we've been working through uh, Luke's biography of Jesus uh, through the opening part of this year so far. And we've seen Jesus teach so many people. We've seen him do big things, claim many things, perform miracles, and it's blown people away. He's cast out demons. He's even spoken about his impending death. And friends, you know that Jesus' death is coming. Uh, you're watching along. It's Easter. And you know that Easter points us to his death. But our big question again why did Jesus die? Why is Easter so important? I mean, this is a question that you need to answer. Well, let's look at Jesus' death together. And as we read this eyewitness account, we'll see that there are two responses to Jesus hanging there on the cross. Now, at this point in Jesus' story, he's been arrested. He's been deserted by his friends. He's been tried. And because the crowd are so insistent, He's been sent off by the authorities to be executed. And now we pick up in chapter 23 of Luke's account at verse 32. So have a look at, with, look at it with me. From verse 32, he says, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And so here's the scene. Three men laid down naked on beams of wood, nails mm, piercing their skin, holding them there, that they then lifted upright, spread out. But we know it's not just the three of them there, don't we? No, it's, it's the soldiers, it's the crowds, hundreds, maybe even thousands of people watching on, mocking, probably even cheering because of the part they had in seeing Jesus come to this point. Cheering that they sent Jesus to die. And so how does Jesus respond? Well, it's verse 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In this moment, Jesus acknowledges something fundamental to our existence. And maybe this is something you don't even agree with yet. 
but he acknowledges that there is a God in heaven. There is a ruler of the universe, someone who created us and all things. And Jesus calls him, do you notice? Father. And what's striking about this situation, I mean, with everything that's happening to him, Jesus asks God, his father, to forgive these people. Now, quick application here for us. If God is the one who needs to forgive, this tells us that God is the one who's been offended by what's going on here. He's the one who's been wronged. He's the one to whom we are accountable in our lives. And see, there is a God to whom what we do actually matters. Jesus points us to the fact that there is a creator who we are answerable to. We are accountable to God for our lives. And the reason here that he asks for the people's, uh, for their forgiveness from God, do you see it? It's because at the end of verse 34, he says, they do not know what they are doing. Jesus says that there's something far bigger going on here than they understand. How does Jesus refer to God here? We, we pointed it out already. He calls him Father. And this kind of Father-Son language, it reminds us of the opening chapters of Luke's Gospel. Right? Think back to Luke chapter 3, where Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River by John. He comes up out of the water, and God's Spirit descends down on him. And then we hear God himself speak at that moment. It's in Luke 3 verse 22. A voice came down from heaven, we're told. You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. As Jesus is being led to die, this is not just any evil that the people are committing, not just a murder. No, this is a spiritual evil of cosmic proportions. Why? Because this is the very son of God that they are driving nails through the hands of. This is the only person to whom God has ever said, with you, I am well pleased. Please, his father in every way. They don't realize how big of a moment this is, what they're doing. Now, as Jesus hangs there, there's two criminals, remember? Uh, one on his right, one on his left. And we're just going to take a moment now to slow down and listen to them, to hear what they say. Because in these two criminals, we see two radically different reactions to Jesus on the cross. So our first criminal now, here we find him sneering, mocking, insulting Jesus. Have a look down at verse 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Are you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Now the first criminal, he isn't alone. He's basically echoing the words of the crowds and the soldiers what they've already said. Aren't you God's man? Aren't you God's Messiah? What's going on here? Aren't you his forever king? Why don't you save yourself? How's that going for you? You're helpless, hanging on the cross. Here is someone, a criminal, moments from death, moments from meeting God himself. And he's still sneering, still mocking, still ridiculing the one of whom God declared, this is my son. Let me ask you, when that criminal, probably not too far away, when he stands before God face to face, do you think God's going to be happy? Do you think the Father in heaven is going to stand there with arms welcoming in a son? Or do you think this man's going to be held accountable for the way he's treating God, for the way he's treating Jesus? I'll let you work it out. Well, now we hear about the second criminal and his response to Jesus. It's radically different from the first, isn't it? I mean, I've heard someone say that people on death row often have a greater clarity in life. And this second criminal, he definitely has a great clarity moment here. Look at verse 40 and 41. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our sins deserve. But this man, he's done nothing wrong. The second criminal, he acknowledges, like the, like the other guy hanging out there, that he too is a rebel. Someone who's done the wrong thing. Someone who deserves to be punished. But he says, that's not Jesus. 
that's not Jesus. He's innocent. He's done nothing wrong. In fact, back at verse 4, and at this same chapter, we see Pilate, the local governing leader, say the same thing about Jesus as he stands before him on trial. There's no doubt that Jesus is innocent. So again, I ask you, why did Jesus die? Well, this criminal, he knows that Jesus has done nothing wrong. But he knows that he has, that he has. And on a greater scale, when we think about life lived under our creator God, he knows that he's rejected God's rule in his life, that he's lived like there is no God, that he's lived like his own boss. So what's the problem with that? Well, in our Western society, in our Western culture, we like to praise that kind of living, don't we? You do you. Forget authority. Break free. Do your own thing. The problem with that, well, Jesus has already acknowledged, in fact, the whole of scriptures acknowledge that there is a God who we're accountable to. God created us and gave us a unique place in his world, in his good world, in fact. He commissioned us to, to rule it, to care for it, and to be responsible for it. And at the same time, for us to honor and obey him as our ruler and thank him, thanking him generously for all that he's done, for all that he's given us. That's good. That's God's good design for our world. In this moment of clarity of the second, the second criminal here, he knows that, that we've mucked that up, that we are on the wrong side of the ledger when it comes to God. Don't you fear God? He says, but I want you to notice what happens next. This criminal hanging there next to Jesus 2,000 years ago, he sees his desperate position before God. He throws himself then on God's son. Verse 42. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. While everyone else is mocking, this guy throws himself on God's son. He sees that somehow Jesus is the one from God, the one who can set things right in the way that we muck things up with God. And so he reaches out to God in desperate, to Jesus rather, in desperate dependence. Jesus, I'm with you. Jesus, help me. How does Jesus answer? Have a look down at verse 43. Have a read of it for yourself. How does Jesus answer? How does he answer this criminal who, who begs for a crumb? How how does he answer this criminal who begs to be remembered? Verse 43, Jesus answered him, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is an amazing statement. This is a huge promise that he will be with Jesus in heaven. This criminal has no right to ask it, to even be remembered. He hasn't done anything to earn asking such a question. And that's the point. He is totally unworthy to ask for even a crumb. But he's given a banquet. He asks to be be remembered. And he's given relationship with God. I mean, this smashes the idea that you can get to heaven by doing good works. Right? Remember, this is a criminal on death row, hanging on a cross. Yet this is the only man in all the scriptures to be given this ironclad promise by Jesus that he has a place in heaven. That's massive. That's massive. So how can Jesus promise this? This criminal, he knew that God is just. He knew that he should fear God's judgment. Don't you fear God? How can Jesus promise him heaven? I think it's a legitimate question. I think it's a question that you and I need to wrestle with again. Because like the criminals, we are not like Jesus. We have not lived perfect lives before our perfect God and creator. Unlike Jesus, we can't say that we've consistently lived to please and honour our Heavenly Father. We can't say that we've also treated other people with the honour, respect and love that they deserve. And this matters to God, because all people are created in His image. And we don't love and honour God 
or them in the way we need to, the way, that, the way they deserve. Friends, we are not like Jesus. When it comes down to it, are the words of the second criminal are words for us. Don't you fear God? We will be punished justly. We will get what our sins, what our deeds deserve. What you do matters to God. Have you thought about that before? Deciding to live our lives our own way, it's not just a personal choice. No, it's rebellion against our Creator. It's defiance that rightly brings God's judgment to us. And since God is just, he tells us in the scriptures that he will make things right in the end. When we stand face to face with God, we will receive what our judgment, what our, what our uh, rejection of him justly deserves. And so again, we need to ask, how can Jesus offer this promise of heaven to the best of people, let alone this criminal on the cross? Friends, look what Jesus says right at the moment before he's, his life's over. Right at, the, right at the moment before he dies. Verse 46. Jesus called out with a loud voice. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. In this moment, Jesus is committing himself to the plan of God. To the plan of his father. But remember, Jesus, he's the only one who could say that he's perfectly lived God's way and, not des and doesn't deserve to be punished. He was perfectly pleasing to God in every way. And so if this was part of God's plan, the question isn't, it isn't, why did Jesus die? The question is, why did God send Jesus to die? The answer? I am a wicked rebel before God. But God crushed Jesus instead of me. Jesus died in, in my place. Jesus died in your place as a substitute so that you can throw yourself on him like the second criminal and experience God's mercy. You see, we do have a God of justice, but we also have a God of love. And never do we see love's, uh, God's love more clearly than right here at the moment of the cross. When Jesus, God's own son, God himself, lays down his life as a substitute for you. Well, this was God's plan throughout history. This is the only way that our sin problem could be dealt with. God's love and his justice, they, they come together at the cross. His righteous anger towards our rejection is satisfied because it's laid on Jesus. Friends, if you wonder whether or not God loves you, look at what he did so that you don't need to bear the judgment of your sin. Do you know what the true definition of love is? The true definition of love? 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. You might know it. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Why did God send Jesus to die? The answer? It's because he takes your rebellion seriously. And because he loves you. And so like the second criminal, throw your life on him. Because if you do, you too can have this ironclad promise of paradise. Life. Forgiveness. Relationship with our Heavenly Father. So let me ask you. Do you personally know that promise of relationship and forgiveness in your life? Is that a promise that you have? Friends, if this is the first time that you've understood this, then be like that second criminal. Throw your life on Jesus. Don't go on ignoring God, but trust Jesus as your saviour and live for him. If you're here and you're still trying to piece this all together, work out who Jesus is, work out why his death matters, then, friends, send us an email. Uh, our email address will be below this video. Uh, hit us up on Facebook, send us a message, and um, let us know that you're keen to keep checking this out, and I'll get back to you. But if you already do trust Jesus, be reminded again. Be reminded how much God loves you. Never forget the forgiveness and relationship 
that costs, costs us absolutely nothing, but costs him his life. Friends, this is someone worth following and living for. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you clearly show us in Scripture not only our problem, our debt before you, the great chasm that's between us and you that's, that's called our sin, our wrong, for rejecting you. But thank you that it's so clear that Jesus died to take that away. That if we cast our lives on him, we can stand before you forgiven. We can have a relationship with our creator. Help us to never to forget that. Help us to always live for you as our God in response to seeing what Jesus has done. Father, help us to accept that into our hearts ourselves. Amen. Well, friends, I hope you know that. I hope you see God's love for you. Uh, let's go now to a time of praise together of our great God who has shown us his love in Jesus. Friends, we come now to a time of prayer and we can pray to a Heavenly Father in response, uh, knowing how much he does love us 
and knowing that he does hear us when we call out to him. And so uh, I invite you just to take a moment now uh, to pause and pray with the people around you. Pray out loud. Uh, Give thanks for God this Easter. Give thanks that he sent Jesus to lay down his life as a substitute for us. Friends, we have so much to give thanks for. So many things that we we could be praying for, uh, both in the life of our church uh, and in our town and in the the wider world around us. So let's take a moment to pray now and then we'll go to a time of praise. I hope today you've been reminded of Jesus' sacrifice and God's love. God loves you. I want to close just with one simple verse. Uh, I read it um, in the time we thought about God's word together. It's from 1 John uh, chapter 4, verse 10. I want you to take this away. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Friends, it's great that you've chosen to to tune in with us this Good Friday. I hope that you're reminded of God's love. And friends, look forward uh, to either seeing you in person on Sunday, uh, or if not, uh, do do, uh, join us again for Easter Sunday as we celebrate our risen Lord, because this is only part one. Jesus' death is part one. Come back again. Let's celebrate our risen Lord who gives us life.